Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi, wa man wala. So this is, I believe, the second in our winter reading list uh, sessions, where we look at uh, publications, recent and occasionally not quite so recent, uh, that we might be uh, curling up with during the long winter evenings, uh, some of which may actually be appropriate as uh, stocking fillers for our non-Muslim friends. So we're not really looking at detailed fiqh texts here, nor yet at masterworks of Islamic philosophy, but rather at books that are a little bit more middle-brow, more general for, a, for an ordinary reader, that nonetheless draw on important issues, but also on uh, some of the more recent scholarship that's been happening. So we've got quite a, uh, a bouquet to offer you uh, in this little session. And I wanted to start first of all with something that, well, is a hundred years old, Marmaduke Pictou's novel, The Early Hours. So why am I choosing this? Well, it has many virtues. Pictou we know as probably the best known translator into English of the Holy Quran. But in his day, he was a best-selling and hugely revered novelist. That was how he earned his living. But he uh, was also a campaigner for Indian independence. He was the editor of the Bombay Chronicle, uh, which was deemed to be anti-Raj, and so he was fired from that. Uh, close friends with Gandhi, uh, the Khilafatist movement, and so forth. Interesting. And the introduction to the book has a uh, potted history. If you're interested in uh, Indian Muslim heritage, Pictou is actually quite, a, quite an interesting figure. But a novelist. So uh, he converts to Islam about halfway through his novel writing career. And it's interesting to see how the Islamic preoccupations and deepening of his <coughs> sort of soul work unfold in this literary genre. So this is generally regarded as his best novel and also as his great Islamic novel. In fact, I would say it's the great Islamic novel in the English language, the early hours. And it's named after the Wadduha, the famous verse from the Qur'an, which indicates that uh, there will always be a new dawn, never despair. And what's it about? Well, it's about the Balkan Wars of uh, 1912 and the years leading up to that final collapse of Muslim power in Europe. So we think about the Inquisition, the Reconquista in Spain, but that's five centuries ago. But something very similar is happening in the east of Europe, in the Balkan Peninsula, uh, more or less within living memory. So Pictor publishes this novel in order to give people not just a sense of what the politics were. He himself was sympathetic to the uh, Committee of Union and Progress and not very keen on Abdul Hamid's autocratic rule, quite unlike Abdullah Quilliam and some other British Muslims who were active at the time. Uh, and he uses his novel to present uh, a sympathetic case to the Committee of uh, Union and Progress uh, through the eyes of a simple, ordinary Balkan Turkish Muslim soldier, Qamar ad-Din. I won't summarize the novel, nor yet provide any spoilers, uh, but for, my, for me it's a very interesting indication of an earlier set of crises which afflicted the Ummah and uh, certainly hurt the conscience of British Muslims at the time. Uh, Pictou went on to create an Anglo-Ottoman society which campaigned for the integrity of the Ottoman Empire when some at Whitehall were thinking that it should be broken up. And we can see what a catastrophe that has led to with new states like Bosnia and Lebanon and Iraq really not working very well after the Ottoman caliphal umbrella is withdrawn. So he kind of prophetically anticipated the disasters of the Middle East and the Balkans in the 20th century after the Pax Ottomanica was withdrawn. But what's most interesting for me in the book is the way in which he depicts very ordinary life and interesting individual events against the backdrop of uh, late Turkish rule in the Balkans. So here is just an example of that. And all of the book is well written. E.M. Forster thought that um, he was one of the great novelists of the day. But here is a passage. Um, Qamar ad-Din has uh, fallen into... Uh, a espionage or counter-espionage uh, ring in the Balkans and is sent on a secret mission on the train which the Ottomans have built up into the uh, hinterland. So this is from chapter 13. 
Omar Adin, in the intervals of conversation, looked out at the ever-changing landscape as the train meandered up into the hills, with here dark greener forest, here the blue of some deep lake under a cloudless sky. It was not the first time he had travelled by the Iron Road, but it was the first time he had been sufficiently at ease in travelling to look around him with such keen enjoyment. This compartment where he lounged was vastly different from the trucks into which they packed poor soldier men. And this was but Ikinji, second class. There was Birinji, first class, also on the train compartments, like a casket made for holding jewels. And some compartments, closely curtained, were reserved for women, the shrill voices of their inmates being heard at every halt. Everything had been arranged with nice convenience and propriety. The train possessed a cheery whistling voice. The guard watched over all like a proud father. The spice of danger in the expedition was a source of energy to Qamar ad-Din, making his mind alert to notice trifles and filling him with a sense of joyous life. He felt quite sorry when the train stopped at the station short of Monaster, at which he had been ordered to alight. The guard spoke for him to a a soldier who was on the platform with the result that he passed out without the slightest difficulty. And then he walks on to his destination in this remote Macedonian town. Out of the open country he passed suddenly into a labyrinth of narrow markets with scraps of awning hanging bat-like overhead, crowded with all sorts of people. Men in turbans, high-crowned fezes, calpacs, multiferes raiment, and women in striped veils of diverse hues. Arriving at a mosque, he had a mind to enter and make up his arrears of prayer before proceeding further. But as he was on the point of doing so, he saw a face well known to him within the gateway and quickly turned away. It was the spy Khalil, last seen at Salonika, the man who had so nearly brought him to destruction on a lying charge. What was he doing in this country town, far from the seat of government, the source of pay for such as he? Praying that the rogue might not have seen him, Kamar hastened to the barracks. The sight of his old enemy had made him anxious to bear the letter to its destination instantly. So it's a kind of thriller as well, a kind of John le Carré in the Ottoman uh, Balkans. It has a romantic interest, inevitably. It's set against the backdrop of the the majesty and the, the... horrifying spectacle of the collapse of the old empire. Uh, I think it's a really good read. It's only a little paperback. Perfect stocking filler. So we must move on to my pick number two. Jamal Mahmoud, The Leaf of the Neem Tree. The Leaf of the Neem Tree, famous Indian tree used in various uh, medicinal and tea-making activities. And this is by a member of the younger generation of British uh, Islam a Londoner, somebody whose literary gifts have already made him known on the BBC and as a filmmaker and as a poet, somebody who, inshallah, has uh, much to look forward to. And here we have a very different British Muslim voice, which is not the voice of the British Muslim going out to try and sort things out in the Islamic world, but the descendant of those who have migrated under very difficult circumstances from the Islamic world to the imperial capital of London, dealing with its materialism, the racism, the Islamophobia, the risks of assimilation. And I think it's one of the most reliable and accessible places to go to if you're interested in that particular aspect of the British Muslim experience. So this is uh, a book which is mostly poetry, but also contains certain short stories and uh, prose anecdotes. Uh, So, walking through Marylebon breeds a love of money. This is a poem. The higher the ceiling, the sweeter the fruit. If you look too long at this place and its brothers, you will wake in the mornings with a mouth full of copper and steel, a lack of saliva and ears shorn of hair. Free to hear all the nothings you need. Behind your eyes you'll keep the names of horses and the floor plans of strangers' homes. Back home, we say, is it your dad's house? Baker Street doesn't live under the feet of your ageing mother, even if you build a mosque there. The curvature of a lip and the long mile of an eye do not need capital to burn, but it's difficult to see with an eye full of ashes. And then another representative poem, Takes a Village. The only place I know like the back of my hand is the back of my hand, and sometimes he could be jive in too. 
In my head they know me in Mirpur and Gillingham. On some nights they mention my name in Karachi, and perhaps once a decade it's uttered in Rajuri, but I doubt many can put a face to it there. They still ask about me at the mosque at home, my only claim to community. No other place smells like elders before they died. I can visit home for a few hours every week to feel like a guest or a friend of my father. How long are you allowed to claim a place before you are accused of lying? Before they stop listening and the food you left out is no longer edible, like spoilt fruit of a whole town's labour. Actually, I want to do a third of these. So I think I receive a lot of poetry, uh, some good, some uh, disappointing, uh, but this is certainly one of the best uh, specimens of the emerging discipline of uh, British Muslim poetry that I've received recently. Get worse, O trouble, goes the first line of the Munfarija. I'm not as brave as Imam Ibn Nahwi, but my therapist said not to respond with fear. She uses the metaphor of a clock that I can't take down, that will be in the other room if I try to go there. Tells me I have to drown it out, that poetry is abstract and I need to target the senses. I respond apprehensively, listen to her medicine. I think of cooking more, being outside and touching the soft life of plants. Even touching a pet, she says, it all sounds so simple. I'm no messenger, but I think of the Arab prophet asking his wife to cover him. I think of trembling, of being a strange father, of my body temperature and neglecting responsibility. I think of the skin on my hands prematurely turning to rubber. I wonder what happens when you mix blood and obsession. If lineage pulls from that well, or if that's water only, I use over and over. They're quite atmospheric, uh, always short, um, reminding me of certain other British poets. Danny Absey perhaps comes to mind. But here we are, published in the United Kingdom in 2021 by Hajar Press, uh, no doubt available on Amazon and at your local Islamic bookshop, with any luck. So moving on, we come to one of my all-time favourites by the Danish Muslim journalist Knud Holmbo, Desert Encounter, Desert Encounter, which he subtitles An Adventurous Journey Through Italian Africa. Again, this is old, like the Pictorial book, came out in the 1930s, but it's been reprinted, and I think, again, it's an example of people in the early 20th century pioneering arts that have subsequently been explored by many others. Uh, this is one of the first works of travel writing by a European Muslim. Hombo was from Denmark and had already published a book um, about the uh, French suppression of the Reef Rebellion in northern Morocco in the 1920s uh, and worked quite regularly for some of the major newspapers in Copenhagen. One of the few Muslims in the whole country at the time, he thought, um, quite a pioneer, <coughs> but very dedicated. And this is his very hair-raising trip, almost unbelievable at times, in a really beat-up, old, falling-to-pieces Chevrolet with a very eccentric American travelling companion and various people that they pick up here and there as they drive across the Sahara Desert from west to east, from Morocco trying to go to Egypt. Again, uh, I don't want to offer any spoilers, but in each one of these countries you get not just uh, vignettes of the traditional life of the populations. Uh, uh, the poverty, superstition, unshakable faith, <coughs> heroism. You also get a sense of the absolute apartheid-style distinction between the rulers and the ruled, the French racism in North Africa, the Italian racism in uh, Cyrenaica and in uh, Tripolitania. <coughs> and the story becomes more and more kind of nerve-wracking until he gets to Mussolini's Libya. Uh, Mussolini, Mussolini bared his teeth most effectively in uh, his African conquests in the uh, invasion of Abyssinia, which was one of the low points of the whole European uh, imperial story, but also in the way in which he occupied Tripolitania and particularly Cyrenaica, which had been quite happy and loyal under the Ottoman Empire until the same year 
1912, when the Balkan provinces were amputated from the Ottomans. Um, the Sultan's Guard traditionally was made up of, of Libyans. They had been, a, uh, it had been a very good relationship. So he kind of commutes between the world of dandified Italian military officers and then at various points as he drives alone, almost dying of thirst in various places as this terrible car breaks down again and again, uh, he starts to uh, get to know as he moves into the heartland of the, the rebellion in Cyrenaica, this Omar al-Muhtar's revolt, what exactly the Italians are doing. Uh, the genocide, the herding of half the population into concentration camps where they're basically left to uh, starve to death, unless they convert to Catholicism and they get baptised, in which case it's a different story. It's a very kind of religionized tale. Um, so here's uh, an example of one story that he uh, encounters in Cyrenaica when he's talking to one of the dissidents who are um, struggling against the Italians. So this is what, this, this is the story he hears. A score of our men, led by myself, had attended a great festival in a neighbouring oasis. It lasted three days and we returned to our oasis. It seemed quiet enough, but the first person I met was my wife. She came running to me, horror in her eyes, her hair streaming down her back, her clothes torn off her body. Oh, do not come home, do not come home, she wailed. Allah, forgive me for having to tell you what has happened. She sobbed and wailed, and I could not get another word out of her. I got off my camel, and then my brother appeared. He came up to me, kissed my cheeks, and said, Brother, you know as well as I do that Allah alone meets out justice to man. Muhammad is dead. Dead, I said, but he was not ill. No, he replied, our brother was shot. The Italians have been here. They shot every fifth man. I was so shaken that I was speechless, but my brother continued, you must place your trust in Allah, whatever happens. Aisha is gone. Aisha is my daughter and I could not control myself any longer. Tell me, I cried, is she dead? He shook his head. No, he said, an Italian sergeant with some Eritrean troops arrived. They drove the camels away and when they left with the animals, they took Aisha with them too. Oh, my brother, could you not have spared my house that shame and my heart that sorrow? You knew how I loved her, but you might rather have killed her than that that disgrace should fall upon my name. I knew nothing until it was too late. Eritrean soldiers kept guard everywhere, he replied. For a long time I did not answer him. Then I said, you must take care of my wife and son. Ahmed, who was only nine years old, stood beside his mother. I'm going to look for Aisha. And I left the oasis on my only remaining camel. I did not know that I was never to see it again. I searched for many months in many towns, and at last I found her. She had been put in a public brothel in Darna, a house where everyone could commit lechery for payment. The chief clenched his hand round his rifle. She knew me, and I asked her to come with me, but she shook her head and wept. Oh, father, she said, I believe that I am ill, and if I have got that illness, I shall never be well again. Aisha, I have forgiven you, as Allah will pardon us all. How did you get here? The Italian carried me away when they took the camels, and afterwards I was brought here to this house. She sobbed. Only Allah the Merciful knows what I suffered at that moment. Kill me, father, she asked. I shall never escape from this place, and death will be a favour when it comes from your hands. So I killed her, kissed her forehead, and fled, fled to the mountains. Everyone was silent. I could not answer him. I was too deeply moved. That's just one of the stories that he hears, and he's got uh, the ear of a journalist. He's looking for these human interest stores, th stories that put uh, a kind of flesh of reality on the bare bones of what the historians record of what colonial rule in those places was actually like. Colonialism plus Mussolini plus Catholicism plus race theory. Uh, a dreadful story. Moving on now to my pick number four. This is called Saracen Chivalry, Councils on Valour, Generosity and the Mystical Quest by Pir Zia Inayat Khan. Uh, this is a different kind of narrative. It's a sort of historical novel, but taking the form of uh, insights into the principle of what Islam calls futuwa, that is to say the chivalry that connects the need to act 
ethically outwardly, even on the field of battle, with the need to act correctly and heroically against the demons and the enemies within. And these things have to be united as with the twin-pointed sword of Imam Ali, who is regarded as the great hero of uh, the warriors of Futuwa. So this book, uh, designed in many ways for a non-Muslim readership, I think, in order to present these, uh, these virtues to them, uh, is a kind of imagination of a book that spun off from the great Parsifal legend. Parsifal, the Knights of the Round Table, King Arthur, the Holy Grail, that kind of heart of European myth-making, sacred symbolism. Uh, some of you will know the story uh, that, uh, according to Wolfram von Eschenbach, who was the German 13th century author of the great Parsifal story, it's one of the monuments of medieval literature, really. Uh, uh, the king of Anjou, Gahmoret, goes off uh, as a knight to offer his services wherever chivalry is understood, <coughs> and he enters the service of the Khalifa of Baghdad, for whom he performs many deeds of heroism. The story says he's a Christian, uh, but the Khalifa is Muslim, and that world of chivalry, Saladin, Richard the Lionheart, often brings together in a kind of mutual respect in a strange way the two uh, rival civilizations. He goes off to Zazamank, the mythical kingdom in Africa, where he falls in love, of course, with Queen Belacane. Mm -hmm. He marries her. Uh, he is white and she is black as ebony, uh, and uh, leaves her pregnant and then goes on to continue his knight errancy. According to the story, she dies of grief. He marries again Herzeloida in Europe, and has another son. So the first son is uh, Feirafiz, who emerges as a kind of mottled, half-white, half-black strangeness. And the second son, the half-brother, is Parsifal, becomes, of course, the hero of Wagner's greatest opera and a major kind of figure in the Grail legends. The Grail is not very big in this particular book, and the book takes the form of Queen Bellacane's uh, advice to her not-yet-born son, Feirafiz, urging him to uphold the honour of the House of Anjou, but also the honour of uh, the Futuwa tradition in Islam. So this is a kind of Futuwet Name, as um, medieval Muslims would have called it. It goes through the basic practices of religion and the basic virtues. So here's a couple of examples. This is Queen Belacane writing to her unborn son. Fils d'Uraga Moret, it pains me more than I can say that I will not see you grow to manhood. I will not see your form, hear your voice, or feel your touch. Even still, I will turn toward you. Though your face may be veiled to me, I pray and trust that I will be given the sight to see what is in your heart. With eyes of fire, I will watch over you, delighting in your happiness and mourning your grief. Before long, you will be a young man. The lengthening of your limbs needs only time. If a boy merely eats, he will grow. But to become a young man in the true meaning of the word, to become a fetter, a chivalrous youth, something more is wanted. Your nourishment must be virtue. Generosity, courage, courtesy and wisdom must be your constant practice, Ibn Gahramayat. You must aspire to the knighthood of purity and you must attain it. For as long as men and women have risen towards the good in thought, word and deed, so long has chivalry graced the earth. Whenever revelation has come down, the order of chivalry has rallied to the prophet's call, renewing its fealty to the ancient covenant. Time and again, with the sweat and blood of its worthies, it has redeemed its vow. Uh, one of the earlier sections of the book goes through the five pillars in which the queen is explaining to her unborn son the enormous importance of the five pillars and their spiritual value. So this is uh, the section on prayer. Fils d'Ura Gahmoret, prayer is ascension. When you bow down, prayer lifts you up. As your head descends to the earth, your heart ascends to the sky. A chevalier needs a cheval. Palfreys and camels are commonplace. Patalamont streets are overcrowded with them. A real Ghazi requires a mount of Borak's noble breed. And what is that? The holy breath of prayer, the sigh that rises beyond time and space. Spirit rides the wind. 
I trust you will perform your prayer steadfastly. Prayer is both a solemn duty and a delicate pleasure. When you step onto your prayer rug, you step from the world of becoming to the world of being. When you lift your arms in praise, the burden of the past and future falls from your back and your heart expands to greet the presence of the present, which is another name for the eternal. Though you stand on earth, you bow and rise in the temple of eternity. To pray five times each day with gesture, thought and feeling is to put in motion the tides of a rhythm that will elevate your soul, deepen your peace, see you through danger and guide you toward the fulfilment of your life's purpose. Hold to this rhythm when all else crumbles around you. Let dust return to dust, but prayer is heaven's portion. And the sections on the zakat and the hajj and, and Ramadan are also uh, simple to understand. It's not an academic book, um, but there's considerable depth here. And then the second portion of the book goes through the traditional virtues of futuwa, uh, on wisdom, on courage, on temperance, on generosity, on justice, on nobility, uh, and so forth. So this is uh, definitely uh, worth giving to non-Muslim friends, because it's about fellowship, it's about virtues, chivalric things held in common. But within it, uh, within the book, is a vindication of the basic spiritual principles of Queen Belakain, the mythical Muslim queen. So this one is published by Omega Publications of New York. Um, strongly recommend it. So we come to the last of my five picks for this year. This is by Jeffrey Einboden, who is an academic in America, who's already published a number of interesting things, particularly on Islam and American literature, Islam and the Enlightenment. Uh, this is his most recent offering, Jefferson's Muslim Fugitives, The Lost Story of Enslaved Africans, Their Arabic Letters and an American President. Well, you can already see that this is a book by an academic that's aiming for a larger public. And there's been a certain amount of interest uh, in Jefferson and his relationship to Islam ever since, of course, the famous uh, episode in 2007, I think it was, when uh, Congressman Keith Ellison of Minnesota, when he took his vow of office to enter the Congress, did so not on the Bible, but on Thomas Jefferson's own copy of the Quran, which I think was probably Sale's translation. And in that era of war on terror, mad Islamophobia, of course, that gave <laughs> the, the journalist something to chew on. And then Denise Spellman has written a book about Jefferson's Quran, Jefferson's relationship to deism, certain trends in the Enlightenment that were influenced by certain Islamic texts and traditions, a certain sort of Unitarianism, uh, a certain sort of insistence that the personality of Jesus is enormously impressive, but only if you consider him to be really a human being rather than divine. That's another story. But in, in Jeffrey's book, what we have is something that looks at some documents. And these documents originate, and he begins the book rather dramatically, with a uh, stormy evening at the White House in 1807. And Jefferson's already had a hard day traveling. His horse almost drowned. There were floods. Um, and so he's sitting in the White House when a mysterious person sends a message saying, I have uh, something of vast importance to tell you. The guy's admitted, I guess it's a bit more difficult these days. <laughs> um, and it turns out that the man comes with two mysterious documents which nobody can read from two fugitives who'd been arrested in Kentucky. What's the significance of this? Well, again, no spoilers. The book uh, weaves in and out of larger questions of Jefferson's and early America's relationship with uh, the Muslim world. But this is specifically about <coughs> literature generated by slaves. So here you have these two fugitives who are sending letters, it seems, to the president in the White House. Uh, when they are Muslims who've been enslaved and are in chains, and it seems have escaped several times um, from various forms of incarceration, uh, including the famous Christian prison in, in, in Kentucky, make it over state lines into Tennessee. That on, it, on its own would make it you know, a great movie. So they send letters complaining of their treatment, but the letters are in Arabic, in a kind of West African Maghrebi type script. Uh, and they say... 
innahu ala dalika la shaheed. God is their witness. They're doing it partly to alert the one who's at the top of the American pyramid, that massively unequal society, to the reality of what's happening right at the bottom. People who aren't even kind of Christianized Africans, but are Ishmaelites. So from the bottom, a letter to the top. Uh, so uh, Einboden goes through these documents, which is found, it seems, I think it's in the Massachusetts Historical Institute. He actually discovered them and they're reproduced here for the first time. And then he uses this as his cue to talk about the neglected story of these people who are at the bottom, the Ishmaelites, the, the rejected ones of American society, who not only have the wrong race, but also have the wrong religion, because they're Muslims and therefore Moors, Saracens, the paradigmatic others, Ishmaelites. So the weaving together of a Muslim identity with an African-American identity um, is something that <coughs> has been significant for the kind of Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali phenomenon later on, for Keith Ellison as well. Uh, but what has not been really brought to the surface recently is the fact that these African slaves very often were highly literate and could produce books when given a chance in Arabic on fiqh, and on doctrine, and they could quote the Qur'an. The first of these actually is not the, the documents that, that Jeffrey has uh, disinterred, uh, but a document that goes back to 1750 or so. And there are others, uh, very moving, tiny little fragments, sh scribbled down, sometimes in prison, sometimes on plantations, sometimes in extremely difficult circumstances, that hardly anybody in America could read. Jefferson certainly didn't know what these things said. It took a long time before anybody could start to um, start to decode these documents. Um, and uh, so this is work in progress. There's so much sort of Black Lives Matter preoccupation, generally legitimate, about the American caste system. But the aspect of the enslaved that shows that actually many of them were princes, many of them were highly literate, many of them were deeply devout and religious and saintly men and women who could write. That's not part of the narrative because generally the kind of Black Lives Matter world comes out of an entirely European Enlightenment Marxist idea and doesn't really like to acknowledge other tributaries and other cultures. It's certainly not multicultural, although sometimes will claim to be so. Um, the liberation that they propose is based entirely on a European intellectual genealogy. So this other story, this other America, this truly um, exiled and Ishmaelite uh, principle, uh, maybe there's other documents to be found, maybe movies to be made, maybe uh, an awareness of uh, the Islamic identity and the literate Islamic identity of many of those early African Muslim slaves in really desperate circumstances. They describe how horrific it was. Uh, plantation slavery really was no joke. Um, we'll come to the surface and we'll start to see the natural connection that exists between sort of America, white, Protestant, Christian, power, gun lobby, Christianity on the one hand. That's not the only way of being a Christian in America, but in the kind of Bush era, the Trump era, it seemed to be dominant. And on the other hand, the rejected elder son, Ishmael, Hajar, the ones who are cast out for being half African, the relig only religion in the world that is, the, that is founded by somebody who has some African blood, because of course the Ishmaelite story is precisely that. <coughs> so there's uh, a lot more to be done on this. Um, Jeffrey has given a wider story about Arabic literature in early American Republican culture, and much of that is interesting as well. But uh, certainly is something that indicates how very ancient, apparently obscure texts can really break surface and become sensations nowadays and can shed light on the actual meaning of injustices and uh, headline issues today. I think this is uh, definitely a very interesting uh, text, and it's Oxford University Press. Um, in New York, they're generally not too expensive, 2020, yeah. So it is new. The reviews have still not quite digested it. But, um, yep, uh, uh, an excellent piece of scholarship that also contributes directly to the culture wars in uh, modern America. 
strongly recommended. So that brings us to the end of my five uh, winter texts for reading um, as we go through these dark and soggy uh, months. But it is encouraging to see how much is being published now, often by a kind of piratical small publishers. These are voices very often from the margins, but then that tends to be where truth is. Uh, the story of religions is all about God being with the margins, being with the dispossessed, being with the discriminated against, with the mustadafin, with the munkasirati qulubuhum. So hopefully as we internalize this, and again, what is really the message of all of these texts, which is Allah ala kulli shay'in shaheed. He's the witness over everything. Uh, the elites may not see it, but God sees it and sees the real shape of history. And uh, it is the mustad'afin who will ultimately be the warithin, as the Qur'an insists. They're the ones who inherit in the next world, if not always in this. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Cambridge Muslim College training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.